Now, for some of you out here, this is going to be pretty boring. Uh, maybe a little bit different spin on uh, the type of videos and content that I create on a regular basis. I'm going to try to offer some information for both beginners and advanced hunters and uh, whitetail enthusiasts. Um, I hear this often, and there's a few terms I'm going to discuss here that um, often get confused a little bit. And I hear often that um, this is a scrape. And when really, this is actually a rub. Um, deer rub their antlers on a tree, they create a rub. It's interesting about a rub, and I talk about this a lot, uh, there's clusters of rubs at staging areas, food sources, bedding areas, travel corridors, and rubs do signify buck movement in different locations um, in different ways. And I'll talk about that in another video here soon. But um, a deer rub, a lot of times, a buck is only rubbing at one time throughout the season. Now in staging areas, his bedding area, maybe along a food source, they might rub those uh, quite often, but still it's more, I believe it's there. He wants to leave his mark and he does want a tree and that's called a rub, not a scrape. Now a scrape on the other hand, what's cool about scrapes is a scrape is something that I see does, fawns and bucks hitting all season long. And sometimes the same bucks will hit the same scrape every single day because it's a part of their pattern. And on that scrape, deer are leaving their preorbital gland scent and then they're urinating on the ground. And so the, there's a lot of collection of scent. There's a big collection of scent that's associated with the scrape and they hit that every day. Now a scrape has a traditional licking branch. I like making my mock scrapes with a branch hanging down, a licking branch or a licking vine hanging down a little bit lower than a traditional licking branch. Traditional licking branch would shoot out about chest level and then a deer is actually taking its toes, a buck, and scraping that out, sometimes even a doe, and they're making that big pad down at the bottom, and that's an actual scrape. This is a rub. A lot of people confuse the two together, and I even see clients of mine that have been hunting for 25 years, and they own hunting property, and they've obviously been hunting at a pretty high level for a long time, some of them, and they'll refer to this as a scrape and vice versa, um, but this is a rub. There's a difference between that and scrape. And this one's actually a pretty cool rub. Uh, we found this. We haven't been up on this part of the property for a long time. There's shavings all over the place. This tree is rubbed all the way around. It's a tree that's been rubbed before. It's a, it's, it's a historical rub, which to me has a lot more value than just a rub that's made right now. But what's cool about this is it's it was hit hard. You can see shavings that are under the leaves a little bit, matted, some on top. So you can tell it was hit multiple times uh, by a mature buck. We know of a few big ones in the area. And, I'm sure one of them, we didn't put a camera on this spot exactly, but whether he hit it three times or 10 times, he's hit it multiple times, pretty cool. Now, rub scrapes, that's one thing. Fawn, yearling, they are not the same. A fawn in hunting season is about six months old, five months old, three months old, whatever he is. You know, most fawns are born around, if you could say Memorial Day, first part of June. And then a yearling, and specifically a yearling buck, is one that is a year in four months old, six months old, whatever he is when you're seeing him during the hunting season. A fawn buck just has nubbins right there. They don't have any bone. Sometimes the bone will break through the nubbin a little bit, but they don't actually have a set of antlers. A yearling buck, that buck that's a year and a half old, that's when he has his first set of antlers. I remember being pretty confused about this myself. I was back in the late 80s, early 90s, right, right around there. And in Field and Stream, they had a a report of deer in Indiana that the average yearling buck had seven points for the state of Indiana. And that kind of blew me away because I thought, well, a yearling at the fawn, how could this happen? Did a little bit more research and sure enough, you know, of course a yearling uh, is a year and a half when they refer to that in cattle, it doesn't really matter. A yearling's a year and a half old animal and a year and a half old buck will sport its first set of antlers. And then a fawn is actually just a few months old, might have a nubbin, nubbin if it's a buck. Something really cool, and I, and I want to offer a little bit of more information about these terms um, for some of you advanced hunters out there. Often, whether it's a button buck or a yearling buck, at some point, and what's interesting, they'll find up in north when the deer need to learn that route to the migration yard, that buck will stick with its mother longer, off until a year and a half old. So it's not dispersing from its mother till about a year and a half. When you get in ag areas, lots of food, no winter mortality rates, don't need to be shown a, a way to a yardage area 
and deer are compacted together a lot more, not separated as much as they are up north, then there's often those buck fawns will actually disperse as a fawn as opposed to a yearling buck. Those mothers are actually kicking them out of the herd. And there's some really good studies. And I'm not going to repeat the percentages because I'm not sure they're exact, but just know that if the mother is still around and she's not killed, that buck fawn, especially yearling buck, is going to disperse a high percentage of the time. They're going to leave that herd. And, and if the mother is dead or not around, then that yearling buck is going to stay in the herd a high percentage of the time, more than the majority of the time, both in both, either way you look at it. What's a great opportunity for you as a landowner, even if you're scouting on public land for remote areas, always consider that when a buck disperses at a young age and it's being kicked out of the herd due to female social pressure, it travels an average of a mile and a half before it settles into its normal area. So it's about a mile and a half. And they see that, they have that barbell home range where this is the fawning grounds and this is where it actually grows up and lives over here and, and establishes its territory. The last thing that yearling buck wants to find is an area that's dominated by female social pressure. It was just kicked out of the herd due to female social pressure, whether it's a button buck or a, a yearling. The last thing he wants to do is find a property that has giant food plots dominated by doe family groups, lots of bedding areas dominated by doe family groups, and you can kind of see where this is going. It's great to have a balance of does and fawns in your property, but you do, you do not want to have the most do does and fawns in the area on your property. It takes a lot of smaller food sources, long, lengthy food sources that have a lot of outside coves and inside features where deer can't look across the food plot. That's often inviting to yearling bucks. My, uh, my property in the UP of Michigan, we went from seeing one spike in 1999 to fast forwarding to 2006. I got pictures of 17 different bucks, passed up 11 bucks, shot two bucks. This is an area where you have 50% fawn mortality, one fawn on average making it to fall. Only half of those fawns are, are bucks. You only have a quarter fawn per doe going into the following spring that can be an actual buck. And yet we went in an area with 15 deer per square mile advancing over a seven year period to see 17 different bucks. A lot of those bucks were focusing on the property on a daily basis, on a daylight uh, basis. And the only way I had, I had eight acres of plots, totally 14 acres, I had a scattering of cover. I believe the property attracted those yearling bucks that were dispersing. They certainly didn't grow up there. We didn't have enough does, we didn't have enough fawns. If you do the math, it might've been two bucks <laughs> over that period of three bucks at the most. Um, but bottom line is, you can make a property that attracts yearling bucks when they're dispersing or repels them. If you're looking on public land, I would look for remote areas that relate to food in some way, but certainly well behind does and fawns and behind that female social pressure that actually pushes those deer away. Now third, so yearlings, fawns, I hope you know, guys know the difference and certainly uh, bucks or buck rubs and scrapes. And third, another topic is antlers versus horns. You hear, hear people referring to antlers as horns. I probably have done it in the past too. Shoot, you probably find one of these videos that I've referred to antlers as horns, but antlers and horns are certainly completely different. Uh, bighorn sheep, they have horns. Those horns stay on their head for the life of that animal. Same with uh, cattle. And actually my esteemed colleague, Dylan Lenz, who's his videotaping, he's, he's uh, always shoots these videos and edits and um, wealth of knowledge. But he reminds me too that uh, horns are hair and antler is bone. So if you think about that, a horn is actually hair and antler bone completely different from each other. And horns are a lot different. Antlers are one of the fastest growing bones on the planet, any animal species. It's amazing. And even my wife as a young hunter and even in this hunting industry, she's been associated with me for many years as far as the business and, and knowing the hunting industry a little bit. And she's gotten into hunting heavily over the last year, but um, she still had that question on you know, antler. Does it stay on the head forever? And of course they do shed. And, and a lot of you out there are shed hunters. I mean, you're seasoned, you, you know all this, but I see hunters all the time that don't realize this. And, and what's cool about antlers, is because they grow every year, they can be influenced by things that happen to that deer and the stress that takes place. In fact, heavy winters, poor food in a given year that's way above average, that can diminish the antler growth actually shut it down. If a deer is wounded, it can diminish the growth. A lot of times, if a, if a deer is in, injured on one side, then that opposite side will explode into something. It could be di diminished, it could be weird, um, it could be almost non-existent, but then it heals itself the exact 
next year. Um, so a lot of times people are quote calling inferior bucks that aren't inferior. We've talked about that in another video um, that really are just injured bucks that are going to completely correct themselves the following year and could grow up to Boone and Crockett and a you know, huge buck and and so um, really no need to to call those bucks. But again, those antlers actually repair themselves the following year, especially on bucks like that where um, they're injured on one side. And so antlers are amazing pieces of bone. There's actually a pain that can be associated with those bucks when they're in velvet and they're growing that, a lot of nerve ending blood vessels. So this area right here where this buck came through, we had a hard time getting into here because of all the prickly ash. That buck does not want to come in here during the summertime and rip his velvet right through all this prickly ash with all these little thorns on it no different than we don't want to right now either and that's why mature bucks when they're growing their antlers during the summertime live in often completely different locations as they do where they're living in the fall when they have that high stem count area where they come to make these rubs right here and it's pretty interesting there's a lot of research that goes back into this barbell home range of mature bucks and it's interesting a lot of these mature bucks go back to where their fawning cover was to rut and move around and live during the summer times, great summer ground, summer fawning, summer food, and then they have another completely separate area that's in a fall range with fall food, fall thick stem count cover like this right here. Pretty interesting how it relates to about a mile and a half difference, no different than how they far they disperse as a yearling buck. I don't think that's coincidence, but I know around here in the ag area, we see the mature bucks where they are in the summer. They're about a mile and a half on average mile from where they're at in the, in the fall. But I hope that makes some sense. I know there's some common terms that I tried to offer some advanced information in there for you that have been around for a while and are seasoned hunters. And I hope that I can attract uh, both um, types of hunters, all types of hunters to my, to my channel, those that have been new. And talk about rubs, scrapes, fawns, yearling, some of the complexities and dynamics that you can actually use uh, for your own information, whether you're using scrapes as a feature and putting a camera on it for sense during your hunting season, knowing the dispersal range, what actually attracts dispersing yearling bucks, and then finally, how those fast-growing antlers, fast-growing bone, amazing antlers, how they're so different than horns, and how those antlers and those bucks that are growing those giant sets of antlers during the summer do not want to live where they do in the fall. Think about that as it all relates to your habitat, what you can do on your land and your habitat this fall. And again, like I say all the time, I can't wait to hear about it. I love your comments uh, down below on the channel and on these YouTube videos. And I really appreciate the dialogue that we have. And I appreciate it and taking the time to watch. If you guys are interested, I have a series of books that I have on my website. They're on Amazon too. You can buy them as eBooks on my website. But all around hunting strategy, I even have a kid's book on there for you. Um, if you know any young hunters that are up to 12, 13 years old, Appreciate the time and I appreciate you watching.